Um, hi, everybody. Uh, the title of this talk is Caching Without Marshall. Uh, my name is Chris Salzberg. I'm a staff developer at Shopify. Um, the background for this slide is a city called Hakodate in the north of Japan, which is where I live. Um, I'm on the Ruby and Rails Infra group, of whom many members are here at this conference and speaking. I'm in a smaller team of about five developers called Core Stewardship. Um, our role at uh, Shopify is to steward the core monolith, which is basically the largest Rails application in the world, probably. Um, and we have to sort of keep it maintainable, keep the code clean, uh, keep it sort of a um, happy environment for developers to work in at Shopify. So along those lines, um, about a year or two ago, we had an exception in production, uh, which uh, triggered an incident which required a rollback. Um, I was not actually involved in the incident itself, but we did the follow-up on it. The exception was a name error, uh, an initialized constant, beta flag service, active record repository. Um, and so basically, when, whenever you ship code, as I'm sure everybody knows, you kind of deal with two universes, right? You have the universe uh, before you ship the code, and then the universe after you ship the code. And uh, in most situations, these most, almost entirely overlap, and you only have a bit of change. Um, but in this case, uh, the change that was shipped was a refactor to a commonly used uh, part of the code around beta flags. Um, and that, th that incident of a beta flag thing was wrapped into an incident of another thing, an in instance of another thing, which was wrapped into an instance of another thing. Um, and that other thing was put into the cache. Um, and, then, and that was in the new universe. And then the old universe, that thing was taken out of the cache uh, unwrapped, unwrapped, and then the old universe is like, I don't know what this thing is, and then, you know, um, things blew up. So that's really not a good thing, and it's not a good thing because there's only really uh, two ways that you can kind of deal with that kind of problem if you've faced it before. Uh, one, one way of dealing with it is just putting less things into the cache, or less variety of things into the cache, because that will avoid that from happening. Uh, the other alternative is to change the code less, right? Like, if you don't change code, this kind of thing can't happen. Um, but that's really not an acceptable solution because we're in a team which is all about making code cleaner. We don't want to stop developers from refactoring their code. So we decided, okay, we have to look deeper and try to figure out what this problem is and fix it. So I'm going to talk about that. So let's talk about caching first. So if you go to the Rails guides, you can find out lots of great information about caching. Uh, there's lots of stuff about page caching, action caching, fragment caching, Russian doll caching. Uh, you can find about all the different places you can put your cache data, um, the file or memory or memcached or Redis. What you will not find very much about is what you can and cannot put into the cache. Like, what am I allowed to put into the cache, right? Um, and actually, if you read under low-level caching, there's a sentence. Uh, Rails caching mechanism works great for storing any kind of information, and the any there is original in the, the emphasis there. Um, and that is because uh, you can actually cache basically anything you want, right? Um, and like many things that seems too good to be true, uh, this is, in fact, too good to be true. And I want to talk about a little bit about why that is. So, um, any kind of caching in Rails uh, basically boils down to calling uh, either write or read on the Rails cache, which is an instance of active support cache, uh, uh, active, active support uh, store, cache store, uh, or some subclass of that. Um, and if you look through the code, I'm not going to go step by step, but you, you'll see that it boils down to basically calling Marshall dump or Marshall load on something. And that something can be almost anything. There are some caveats, but basically that's it. Um, and we use a different store, memcache store, but it's basically the same story. It defaults to, to Marshall. Uh, I will say there, there are, there's a little bit more to it. So when you cache data, you may know this, it actually wraps the data in with some metadata, uh, which is expiry in an optional version. It puts that whole thing into a thing called active support cache entry. There is a change between active uh, Rails 6 and Rails 7. So before Rails 7, um, this whole thing, this active support cache entry object was actually dumped by Marshall, was encoded by Marshall and dumped, which was really inefficient actually, because you actually cached that string after active support cache entry. Um, in Rails 7 now, this is much more space efficient, and that's actually because Jean Boussier did some work related to this project um, that I'm gonna talk about to make that more space efficient. All the issues with Marshall are still there, so everything I talk about today is still relevant in Rails 7, uh, but it's slightly more space efficient. Okay. The problems with Marshall, I mean, Marshall is a sharp knife, right? So the problems with Marshall are well known. This is not a secret. You can go to the Marshall documentation, and it says, you know, Marshall load is not suitable as a general purpose serialization format, and you should never unmarshal user supplied data or other untrusted data. And, you know, if you don't believe me, there was a CV in 2020 related to exactly memcache store and Redis cache store. So this is a known issue, and having it in the cache can be uh, dangerous for these reasons. So you might be curious what's actually happening inside this sharp knife. Uh, you might try to look at the the code for Marshall, and you'd be disappointed, of course, because it's not written in Ruby, of course, it's written in C. Um, and as far as I can tell, there's very little out there talking about how Marshall actually works. Um, and so I want to talk about that, because 
before you can remove Marshall, you have to figure out what it's actually doing, because otherwise it'll come back to bite you. So let's talk about Marshall. So I'm gonna take something that's a little bit meaty just to kind of see what's actually happening in Marshall. So we'll take in a, a record, uh, just a simple post model, um, create a record with the title caching without Marshall. And it's pretty simple, right? You just pass it to, to Marshall dump, um, and you get, some, you get this big blob, right? Uh, binary blob back. And I, when I ran this, it was like 1,600 bytes long. Um, and if you look in there, you can see it's got constants, it's got instance variables, obviously. Um, it's got values, so you can see it's got caching without Marshall appearing like three times. So it's not particularly efficient here. Um, but of course, the magic is that now you can take that big blob of whatever that is, pass it to Marshall load, and like presto, you've got the thing back, right? Exactly as it was. And you can do this in another thread, in another process. You can do it a week from now, or a month from now, or a year from now, and you get exactly the thing back. So, Marshall encodes the universe, right? It just encodes everything there. It ignores all concepts of privacy. It gets exactly what you put in back out. Um, and this would be great uh, if our universe was static. Uh, but our universe is not static, and we ship every 30 minutes or an hour, typically during the day. So our universe is constantly changing, and in that universe, uh, Marshall doing this is actually quite risky. And this applies to all uh, Rails applications, by the way. So what's actually happening in Marshall? Like, what is it actually encoding when it encodes the universe? So you can find most of that in Marshall C and MRI Ruby. <clears throat> and there's a bunch of constants at the top of the file which pretty much tell you what it's basically doing in there. Uh, the first thing, it's got a major and minor version. Uh, this is 4.8, this is not related to the Ruby version, um, and this hasn't changed uh, for, I think, years and years. Uh, so you can basically treat this more or less as a constant. Um, then there's a bunch of things that I refer to here as atomic. This is my terminology, not anything official, but this is basically stuff that cannot contain other objects inside. So this is things that you would expect like nil and true false and then numbers and floats and symbols and also classes and modules. Um, then there's kind of things that are composite here. Again, these are my terms, but it's kind of what you would expect. So things like arrays and hash, hash with a default value, which is a hash def, um, objects. Also things you might not expect that ha can have objects inside them like strings and regexes, which I'll come back to. And also there's a lot of like mysterious stuff. <laughs> which uh, you probably wouldn't, I actually didn't know what some of these meant until I actually prepared for this talk, so I'm gonna talk about this too. So let's start with the, the more basic stuff, so objects, right? How does Marshall encode objects? Um, this is kind of straightforward, so there's a type called type object, represented by a small character O, ASCII O. Um, and if we take that byte string I had earlier, uh, and we convert it to uh, hex to make it a bit easier to read, um, the first thing we can see is this is the version I mentioned, so every, basically every Marshall thing you encode starts with this, so that's easy. Um, and then everything else is just an object. And so it starts with a small character O for object, and then it has the uh, class name for the object, uh, which is actually a symbol, which starts with a colon for, to represent a symbol. It has a length. Uh, the length is four, but it says nine because it's an efficient way of storing integers that does this, but um, that means four, basically. And then POST for a post, and then the number of uh, instance variables. And then it's just got all the instance variables, name of the variable, value. So here we've got like new record, uh, that's the name of the first instance variable, and then a value, which is capital F. Um, and that's sort of what you'd expect. It just, and you can just keep going. And it gets all the instance variables, and each instance variable can in turn have other objects which can have other instance variables, and so you can see how this gets very big very fast. Um, another really important thing that Marshall encodes are instance variables. I mentioned there are instance variables in objects, but there are also instance variables on things that you might, that Marshall doesn't really think of as objects. So these are basically uh, string, regex, uh, hash, and array. These are kind of special objects. Technically, they're objects because they subclass object, but they're treated specially in Ruby, and so Marshall also treat them specially. So you can actually assign an instance variable to a string if you want this way, right? This is not something you'd probably be doing every day, but you could do it. And then you might ask, well, can Marshall handle this kind of weird thing? And actually, Marshall can handle it, and it will correctly encode this thing. Um, and this is because it has a special type called type IVAR. Again, none of this is documented as far as I can anywhere. Um, but this is how it actually works. And this works for things like uh, hashes and also arrays and regexes as well. Also, this was really interesting to me. I, I was curious, like, how does uh, Marshall handle circularity, right? So and we're going to come back to this in a second. But records can have associations which can point back, like have an inverse and which can point back to the record itself. So like our, our active record object can have a inside itself, can reference itself. So how does Marshall handle this? Because you could end up with endless recursion, right? Um, and this, the really minimal example of this is just take an empty array and just put the array into itself. And you've got a circular kind of thing happening, right? So inspect, which you see there, actually handles it gracefully. But the question is, like, does Marshall segfault or something? Like, what actually happens here? Uh, in fact, it does not segfault. It actually correctly gives you back the thing. And you can check that the first element is, in fact, itself. So it works. Um, and I think that's kind of neat, actually. And if you, if you look, the reason it can do that is because it has one of those weird types down there called a type link 
uh, it also has a sim link for symbols specifically, but for objects it's got a type link. And it works like this. You have, it's actually quite uh, efficient. So you start with the uh, open bracket, which is a type for the array. The length, <clears throat> the six means one here. Um, and then you've got really short, you've just got a link type, and then the position it's pointing to, it just points back, it's basically like a pointer to the first thing in the, in the object itself, or in the byte string. So that's like the serialization for that thing I just showed you. So Marshall handles circularity out of the box, which is important because uh, when we deal with this ourselves, we're gonna have to re-implement this, so. Um, the last thing I wanna mention <clears throat> is core type subclasses. This might not seem so surprising, but actually it requires some special things in Marshall. So if you subclass one of these core types, I don't know if this is not, this is my terminology, but um, like I said, hash array, uh, regex, and string are kind of special. So if you subclass a hash, uh, and then you, you know, create an instance of this thing, uh, it'll look like a hash, but of course you can check that the class isn't in fact my, my hash. Um, but how is Marshall gonna handle this? Because if Marshall encodes it as a hash, a hash doesn't have like a class on it. Um, as it turns out, it does do this correctly. Um, and it does it correctly <clears throat> because it has a special type called U class. I don't know why it's called U class, uh, but it's represented by a capital C and it, so it wraps these special uh, object types and this U class, which allows it to store the uh, class name along with it. So it stores my, my hash along with the hash data. Okay, so why, why am I going through all this detail talking about Marshall when this talk about caching without Marshall? Um, and the point is that really, um, whether you realize it or not, if you're running a Rails application, you depend on Marshall doing most of this stuff because somewhere in your code, you're probably doing one of these things, you're definitely doing one of these things, probably doing more of them. Um, and so if you decide, like we did, to one day try to take Marshall out, you will find probably that stuff, is, stuff breaks that you didn't even know was happening. And this is actually, by the way, a reference to the movie Fantasia by Disney in the 50s, and Mickey is the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and he's got some stuff to do and he's lazy and he doesn't want to do it. So he, he brings the mop to life with his magic and then he goes and has a nap. And then when he wakes up, the place is all flooded and the mop has just been doing all the work forever. And so Mickey decides he's gonna chop up the mop and then the mop becomes many more mops and it just gets totally out of control until the sorcerer just kills the whole thing. And this is what I feel like the relationship is between Rails developers and Marshall. Um, we kind of delegate everything off to Marshall and then just hope that it's gonna work, but uh, without you even realizing it, Marshall is doing a lot of stuff there that you, you might need to think about. So I wanna talk about now about how we actually um, got in there and figured out how to uh, use the cache without using Marshall. So we want, again, this was the situation I had at the start of this talk. Um, something goes in the cache, it blows up. So we want that not to happen. We want it to come out and not blow up that way. So we need a format uh, that does not encode the universe the way Marshall does. Uh, we used for that a format called message pack. Message pack is a very efficient binary serialization format, so Marshall is also binary, so that, in that sense, they're similar. Um, but the really key difference here is that Marshall is generic, so it's, it's used, you can, there are libraries for like uh, Java and Python and other languages as well. Uh, it's, it's generic by default. Uh, you might not know it, but you probably have it in your gem file because it is actually a dependency of Bootsnap. So, on the surface, it's similar to Marshall, right? So you can give a hash to message pack pack. So pack and unpack are like dump and load in Marshall, similar idea. Uh, give it a hash. Um, I get something that looks kind of like a Marshall encoded uh, string, and then I can pass the string back to uh, message pack unpack, and then I get back the decoded thing. So this looks really similar to Marshall, and actually in this particular case, it's basically the same as what Marshall would do. It's also very similar because it has uh, core types, which are, also, which are very similar to what I mentioned the types were like uh, in Marshall. So it's got like atomic types here, like integer and nil and Boolean, which is like true and false, uh, floats, and then raw, which is a string, which can be is a UTF-8 string, or, uh, and then a binary values. And then it's got uh, composite values, which are um, arrays and map is basically hash. So, so far this is pretty similar, right, to what Marshall does. Uh, the key difference here is that obviously there's no object type because this is not a Ruby specific encoding. So there's no object type and there's no instance variable type. And this is a good thing. We don't want these things to start with because that's exactly what caused our problems, right? So just to kind of show the difference, if we have like a string we pass it to Marshall dump, uh, this is the byte string you get. Um, you can see the characters F-O-O like in that byte string. Uh, that's six, six, six F, six F, that's actually foo. The rest of the stuff is sort of stuff wrap, wrapping around that. Uh, you can see in Marshall, you've got the open, the quotes, which is the type, two, two, and then the length, which is eight, which means actually f uh, three, sorry, so F-O. And then you've got this whole thing. I mentioned the type IVAR. 
that's the instance variable type. That's what I was saying. So it, to wrap this string with an instance variable, it uses IVAR, and then the instance variable is used to, it's a special instance variable in this case, which is a capital E, which is for the encoding of the string. So it uses an instance variable to encode the string's encoding, and that says this string is a UTF-8 string. So notice it uses a Ruby native idea to encode this encoding of the string. Um, if we go to message pack, this is like way shorter, right? Right off the bat, you can see. And you can see most of the thing is actually the ASCII, or the FOO. So most of the data that's stored is just storing the thing itself, clearly. And even the type, oh yeah, so the default encoding is UTF-8, so it doesn't need to encode that. Uh, so that's not there. And then the actual type is stored along with its length. So uh, the bits 101 says this is a string of, string of length uh, less than 31 bytes. And then the 11 one is actually the length, which is three bytes, so FOO. So it's a really, really compact format. Um, and we looked through those core types, and we looked, we, I did a grep of our uh, core monolith to see, like, what, where were we calling uh, Rails cache write, Rails cache read, because we need to know, like, what kind of things are going into the cache, roughly speaking. Um, and of course, there's a lot of stuff beyond those core types. So we clearly were having, like, records going in there. We also have, like, objects. We don't even know what they are necessarily. So we need more than just the, the default message pack types. So we need a format that does not encode the whole universe but that allows us to encode like parts of it. And this is really important. If MessagePack couldn't do this for us, we couldn't use MessagePack for this. But as it turns out, MessagePack actually does this, and this is actually the, really the killer feature for us um, of this gem, or of this format. Um, so you can create, uh, in MessagePack Ruby, you can create an instance of MessagePack Factory. And then you can customize it, and you can customize it by defining like, what are called extension types. Uh, so you can call register type, and then you can define whatever your type is. And it's got like an, a, a type, which is a number from zero to 127. So there are a maximum of 128 uh, types you can define. Then you give it the class. And this, uh, this actually matches subclasses. So I'm gonna talk about a date one, because it's kind of, our, was, this is actually we use in production, this date, date uh, extension type. Um, but it matches subclasses. And this is a, usually what you want, but it can bite you, so you have to be a little careful with that. Uh, then you define the serializer and the deserializer. And these are called packer and unpacker in message pack speak. So date is a kind of a simple one, so I chose it as an example. So uh, for the packer and unpacker, packer takes a date object, returns a byte string, unpacker takes a byte string, returns a date object. And it's kind of, I think, what you would expect if you think about it, right? You got the date, you take the year, the month, the day, you call array pack, which is now a Ruby method, not a message pack method here. Uh, you pass it a format string. In this case, S is 16-bit, 16-bit uh, signed, and capital C is 8-bit unsigned. Uh, so there's two of those. So this packs it into a 32-bit uh, string. Um, and then on the way back, you call string unpack. Again, this is Ruby stuff. You may have seen this. Um, and you basically do the other way around. You take the string, the byte string, and you take out the values from there, and then you create a new date object. So this is kind of how these unpackers and packers work. And just to play that out, if you have a date, it's this is today's date. Um, and then we call factory. That has the extension type defined on it. You get back a uh, byte string like this, and you can actually break it down. D603 is the type extension type 3 in message back. Uh, E607 is 2022, 5 is 5, and then 11 is hex 417. So you, we've encoded the date. So this is pretty powerful, right? We can encode whatever types we want, and they're, they're really compact uh, and encoded, and we can do, do up to 128 of those. The other feature, oh, and then you can bring it back to life, sorry, you can load it back. The other really kill, killer feature for us, which is not really something you would think of as a killer feature, but it's actually really important, is that message pack will not accept types that are not defined. So it will, it will blow up if you give it something that it doesn't know. And that actually ends up being really, really important because if we couldn't do that, we'd, have, we'd be back in the same situation we were in before. So here I've created a, a hash with a value that's an array. So it, you can wrap it however much you want. It'll, it'll you know, run through all this, um, however deep you put it in. And then if you try to do this and you have no type for object, uh, message pack will blow up. Um, it will not blow up in the nicest way. It'll blow up with a no method error, with an undefined method to message pack, which is not like super uh, understandable, but we can, use, we can work with that, right? We can just check the message, check the value that was, that was dumped, and this works. And this is enough that we can say, if we have not defined an extension type for these things, message pack will blow up and we can catch that. So this was really important. So what we did is we actually ran with message pack and Marshall together for a period of, I think, around six months or so. I would not recommend trying to do this in one shot because it most certainly will not work. You kind of need a migration path, and that's what we basically did. And the idea is probably what you would imagine, right? So the puzzle piece here is an object. We throw the object uh, at factory dump. The factory has our extension types defined, that are some of those ones like I showed you just now. If it works, we get back a byte string. We prepend, uh, pre prefix that with a version byte prefix, which is basically says which extension types were used when we encoded this thing, so that when we bring it back to life, we can use the same extension types. Um, 
And then if it fails, like I just showed you, we rescue the failure, the Mona method error, uh, and then we just fall back to Marshall, right? So, and then we just dump it, and then the Marshall prefix tells us that this thing is a Marshall encoded byte string. Uh, so the other way around is kind of straightforward, right? You look at the prefix and then you figure out, is it Marshall? If not, it's one of those extension types uh, like that. And then the rescue is important, and this is a bit small font, but this is the original code we have. We don't have this anymore because we are entirely on message facts, so we don't need to do this anymore. Um, but the key thing here is that we log the hell out of this thing, right? So when we actually were doing this, we throw everything at stats D, we throw whatever logs. We just log, we log the type that, was, that it failed on, so if it goes through all this recursion and hits something, that thing will actually go and we'll see what that was so that we can go back and say, you know, do we need a type for this or should we not be actually encoding that in the first place? Um, so I recommend if you do this, this is really important. This is from the tech doc. Uh, this is like the original payload, Marshall payload versus the MESPAC payload. As I said here, you can see active support cache entry is in the uh, Marshall payload. That's uh, rail six, rail seven, it would not have that anymore. It would be shorter. It would be more compact because of work that John Busey did. Um, but basically the same problem is still there. <clears throat> you can see the version by prefix, so it's zero, zero. <clears throat> and there's a compression prefix because we also conditionally compressed. I'm not gonna talk about that, but we use snappy for compression. So you may see snappy come up here in the slides. Um, so I mentioned we have this date type. Uh, the date type alone was not enough. We had a number of other uh, types that we defined, extension types that we defined. Um, Jean Boussier had done some previous work with uh, message pack, so they were already there. So symbol is actually out of the box in message pack Ruby. You can just enable it and it, it works. Um, and then we had uh, type, date time, date I mentioned, and also uh, big decimal. So those were, that was our zero, zero version. Um, but we realized, I mean, right away, um, actually, uh, Rafael Franza was actually quite adamant that we, we needed to support uh, active record objects. Like, that's a really key thing, and Rails is caching re records, right? So we needed to deal with um, active record base objects. And as you probably know, records have a lot of stuff. They're, they can be really complicated. Uh, so how do we cache records? Um, and the really key thing here is we can cache the attributes of a record pretty easily. We can just take the attributes and just dump them in the cache. Um, but the, the, the hard part here is that we also want to cache the associations that have already been loaded on the record, right? So if you load a record and you call the, let's say, the comments of a post, uh, you've now done the, the SQL and you've got the result back. You don't want to actually do that again if I pull that from the cache. So Marshall will handle that because Marshall just throws everything in there, but we need to handle this somehow. So the way we did that is we defined a register, we registered a type for it. So again, active record base will cover all subclasses, so it covers all records off the bat. Uh, and then we defined a, uh, what's called an active record packer, but really this just wraps something called an active record coder. So active record coder takes a record and then converts that record into a bunch of arrays of core types, and then that thing is then passed to message pack, which just packs it into a byte string. So I'm gonna talk about active record coder just quickly because this was kind of an interesting thing that, that I worked on mostly. Um, basically, just to, we just add a little bit to our previous model. So we have a post class, it has many comments, a comment belongs to a post, and the important thing here is that it has an inverse, right? Because that circularity thing I mentioned, Marshall handles this, right? That was that type, link type I talked about. So we have to kind of do something like a link type to make this actually work. Um, and I just wanna kind of give a broad overview of basically if you have a post with two comments, right, on the top left here, um, it's got two comments. Each of those comments has a belongs to, which points back to the post. So if you wanna kind of uh, serialize this whole thing, you're gonna have to traverse this whole thing. So we traversed all the, we basically, uh, the algorithm kind of traverses all the associations uh, it goes from the post. Every time it sees a record that it hasn't seen before, it puts it into this thing called an instance tracker, and then it just assigns it an, an ID, like a zero, one, two kind of thing. So it sees a post, puts a zero in there, remembers that it's a post, goes to the first association comment, sees a comment, puts a comment in there, gives it a one, goes to the, the belongs to association on the comment, and then says, I've seen this before, so it reuses the previous index instead of going endlessly into recursion. So that's how we avoid the infinite loop kind of problem. And so that's down here, right? So those zeros, reference the object that we already had. So this is how we describe all the associations. And these are just arrays here, this tree. So it comes down to something that looked like this. And then after we're done, we just go into that instant tractor thing, just run through everything that we saw, take all the class names, dump those, take all the attributes, dump those. And this, this thing together is, is how we encode a record along with its loaded associations. Uh, and this actually works out quite well. It avoids the problem of, like I said, having to reload stuff, which would be not very efficient. Um, and the interesting thing is that you take that and then you encode it with message pack into, uh, into a byte string. It comes out to around 300 bytes, right? And I mentioned before that the post alone with no associations was 1,600 bytes, so already we're doing pretty good. But if you now throw this at Marshall, 
Marshall will take 4,000 bytes, so that's a 13x plus improvement over what Marshall would have done with the same thing. Um, and that's because Marshall encodes like everything, ton including tons of stuff you don't need, including duplicates of things you didn't need. Um, so it's a really big improvement, and we saw this in production when we actually shipped this, uh, that our Rails cache memcast fill percent dropped by quite a lot. You have to also keep in mind here that the, uh, the cache stores a lot of things like Booleans, which don't really change that much between message pack and Marshall, they're almost the same. But even then, the, the, the size difference in like records and other complex objects was enough that we really saw quite a big drop. Uh, so this is actually from our dashboard when we were running this, so we shipped that uh, we right away saw that we were already up to over 90% coverage with message pack, but we still had some things that were falling back to Marshall. Uh, you may have noticed that when I showed you that uh, serialized stuff, we're hard coding class names, we're hard coding association names, which you know you should be kind of screaming because this whole talk started off by saying that this is a bad thing and if we're gonna break production, which is true. Um, and this is sort of a bit of a cheat here. Um, but the thing is that because we're working with a cache, we can kind of cheat in this way a little bit because when we decode the thing, if we see a class that we don't have anymore, we can raise a very specific exception and we can rescue that in the cache and we can just say, okay, like, we'll just pretend that wasn't there, right? <clears throat> so when you ship code and you, the class names change, for a period of time while you're shipping, you're not really using the cache and then eventually you switch over to the new one. So we can handle the situation gracefully um, and this actually works out to be quite a, quite a good solution. So we had the core, those core symbol type, uh, symbol time, daytime, date, big decimal, then we did active record base, uh, then there were still some other cases that we needed to cover. Uh, one of the cases was a hash within different access. If you know, this is in Rails, how you encode things, uh, hashes, so that symbols and string keys are basically treated the same. Uh, it's a subclass of hash, which I said is a core type. So this is a problem. Uh, Marshall will handle this, of course. Like I said, it has a core types uh, thing. But message pack will not by default. So if you throw a hash within different access into uh, message pack, it'll come back as a hash. So you'll lose that, and that actually we noticed, luckily we noticed this in tests, tests caught this, always write tests. Um, but uh, it, it actually didn't work, and also not only that, but message pack couldn't encode that. Like there was not, it wouldn't work when you tried to define an extension type for a core type like subclass like that. So we actually had to fix message pack to get this to work. Um, but it did indeed work, and we got that one, so that was a big one. And then we just kept going. We basically added extension types for, um, so active support time with zone. Um, and at this point, we were like at 90, 99 plus. We were really at the long tail, right? Um, and once we get to the long tail, we're in a situation where we can't really just say to developers, like, you know, define whatever extension types you want, because we're a company with three thousands of developers, and we would quickly hit the 128 limit. So what we did instead um, is we defined a kind of a fallback. So we got 128 of these things. We defined the last uh, extension type as object, right, which is kind of the, the ultimate thing. So everything hit, hits object. Um, and that way, when it hits object, we can take whatever is being thrown into the cache uh, and look and see, does it have an instance variable which we used as, as pack, and does it have a class method uh, from pack? And if, they, if it does, <coughs> we treat those as the serializer and deserializer methods on the, um, on the class. And that way, you know, any developer who wants to serialize something which is not a standard thing can just define these methods, and their thing is now serializable. And that avoids the, the problem with uh, limits on extension types. Um, we also use that to define um, some helper uh, modules and classes. So one of them is a struct module, so you can include this into your struct. And if you include it in your struct, it will add those, that as pack and from pack methods. And it will do it in such a way that you encode the struct along with a digest, and the digest uh, captures the attributes that are on that struct. So that way when you deserialize it, it checks the digest, and if it matches, it's all good. But if you changed attribute names in a deploy or something, it will see the digest changed, and then again, it will, it will catch the issue, and then it will treat it as a cache miss. So again, we can handle these kind of like situations that I mentioned at the start of this talk uh, in ways that are graceful and that avoid the, the, the kind of stuff blowing up. <clears throat> so this will, this will raise if you give it a digest that doesn't match. So this is the kind of way we basically covered that last you know, fraction of a percent, that long tail. And with that, we got to 100%. So this was, I think, I don't know, six months or eight months ago or so. Um, and we entirely removed Marshall from the cache. Um, and so this is the world we're in now, right? Anything can go anything through Marshall message pack. And it, it really, it frees developers. So developers don't have to worry that their big refactor is going to suddenly blow up on cache. And I don't know how many people have faced this, but we definitely have. Um, so this is, this is really, really great. Um, a lot of stuff I've talked about today, most of what I talked about has been uh, extracted into a gem called Paquito, uh, under Shopify Paquito, also you can uh, gem, gem required. Um, I wanna give big thanks to Jean Boussier. Uh, he did a lot of the work on, uh, especially on the extraction, but also on the work uh, leading up to that. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>